the ways that a woman has to be this tamped down version of herself, there's that parallel between her being locked in the red room at the beginning and Bertha being locked in the attic, like all these things, I think really support the idea that Bertha is in so many ways, a metaphor for a part of Jane. Bertha is, I think, an example of what Jane could have become, like you just said, if she didn't have these influences. But I also made note that it wasn't just like the influences of like having a temple and a Helen, but Jane also had certain privileges that mm -hmm. enabled her to step away from this. It allowed her to escape the hardships of that life, and Bertha never had those privileges that gave her that opportunity. Lillian, welcome back. It's our very first sort of character study episode, and we are doing it for the one, the only, uh, the infamous Bertha Antoinetta Rochester Mason, Mason Rochester. <laughs> how do you feel? What? How are you feeling about this? I, I want you to think about all of the things you could feel about Bertha. Mm -hmm. And I want our listeners to do this. And I want you to know that I have felt all of those things this week so hard. Yeah. No, I feel you, dude. <laughs> this is going to be one that I think we're going to be not only just doing an analysis, but also sort of, at least me anyway, tapping into sort of my own personal feels about even how some women have to react in society nowadays. So yeah. we're going to dive into this and it's going to be a time. Yeah, I think it's, there's a lot to discuss here and there's a lot of ways to interpret this. And we did probably, I, I'll speak for myself. I know you did a lot of work for this. I did more work for this episode than any of the other episodes. We usually just like watch a thing mm -hmm. and then show up and talk about it. And we tell people we're goobers. So it doesn't really <laughs> matter that they, like they know we're goobers. So who cares? <laughs> and there's something about Bertha that is so complex to me mm -hmm. in the layers of the conversation. Yeah. And I think you and I have talked more about this episode than we usually do. We tell our listeners all the time, we try not to talk about the episodes before we record them because we want our hottest, freshest takes for you, our lovely listeners. Mm -hmm. This time we talked a lot about it because we know this is going to be a long boy mm -hmm. and we want to make sure we talk about what we're most qualified to talk about and what we think is most important to make sure to at least touch on when we discuss Bertha. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I know we both had, at least, I don't know if you actually had an opportunity to go back and re-listen to the Hot and Bothered podcast episode they did on Bertha. I wanted to, I didn't, but for okay. anyone who is like, I want to hear some people who actually know what they're talking about, <laughs> talk about this, then yes, that is the episode and the show that you should go to. Yeah, and I think they have a very critical lens yes. on it, um, which I think is necessary and important. And But I, there's a particular quote. So they had an expert or an author on. I would call him an expert. Mm -hmm. um, his name is Marlon James, and he is a Jamaican author. And he discussed a lot of different things about the idea of Bertha and Jane Eyre in general. And he sees it in its whole complexity, which I think is one of the things I struggled with in a few of the different places I saw this week where people were like either deeply defensive of Jane Eyre and of Rochester and saw criticisms about the way Bertha is treated as, as essentially dismissals mm -hmm. of the entirety of Jane Eyre. Mm -hmm. And then I also saw other people who were using a criticism of Bertha as a dismissal of the entirety of Jane Eyre. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason I felt so many feelings <laughs> is I don't think either of them is wholly encapsulating a conversation around this book and this character. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wanted to start with a quote that I think um, Marlon James did a great job of really capturing that feeling for me mm -hmm. when he was asked by the host do the th does he think this story should carry on? And is the harm and potential criticisms of Bertha enough that we should set Jane Eyre aside and no longer hold it up as a great piece of literature or something we can and should enjoy? Mm -hmm. And he really captured that in this quote here, which is, as a Black guy, gay guy, a man from a foreign British colony, if I start going after things that are offensive, there will be no more English literature. My problem isn't that this book is carried on. 
my problem is that the critical thinking has stopped. And then he goes on to say a few more things before sort of summarizing that in, we have this idea that we can either enjoy a book or analyze it. And that's bullshit. Yes, it should always be both. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of my favorite things that about the way that we get to enjoy all these different adaptions is there are so many ways right. to interpret so much of this story. Yeah. And I think almost nothing more than Bertha. Yeah, I think so. Um, for your listeners out here, um, just to give you sort of an idea of kind of how we're going to be approaching sort of discussing her character is we want to start uh, with the source material. We want to talk about, you know, what for sure do we know about Bertha? And then from there, we want to start kind of interpreting things to be like, okay, what do we take from this? That's something I think I will be discussing a lot about the credibility of our narrators, um, the influences mm -hmm. that they have in the way that they describe and experience and share things. But then, yes, when talking about later, kind of once we sort of, did, you know, dive in and kind of explore our understanding of who she is to then talk about, okay, how does she affect the story? Why is it so important that Bertha is portrayed this way? How have different people in the adaptations we've seen taken their interpretations of the character to tell the tale that they want to tell? And I think that's one thing that's very interesting. So I'm very curious to have all elements of this discussion, but also the kind of we're starting with the source material and then we'll be making our way into what people have kind of done with that and how they continue to interpret it. Do we want to start the way we usually start with adaption <laughs> and just generically our feelings on Bertha? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, do you want to go first since you offered it up? And <laughs> you no, I want to put you in the hot seat after I monologued for five minutes. At the beginning. Oh my gosh. I think my overall feelings of Bertha after, so this morning I sat down, I looked at all the passages that I felt in the book were relevant to mm -hmm. like how she is portrayed and how she is seen by others in moments of her agency. And then I asked myself this big question, which I think will take up a, a big chunk of our discussion today of this whole kind of idea, like, was she crazy? Like if she was mm -hmm. like in today's time period, like how would things be different for her? You know, is she like this villain or is she like a misunderstood person? And for me, I think my conclusions that I've kind of drawn, which I'm excited to dive into is I feel like she is an incredibly tragic character. And I think mm -hmm. that is my main sort of thing is I'm like, I think she's in a, in a story, which we've already like talked a lot about, about how it gives us big chunks of like Jane's sad childhood and then Jane's mm -hmm. sad time on the moors afterwards. We then in the middle are given this glimpse of this woman who has lived an even more wretched life than Jane. Mm -hmm. And I think having that element there that's constantly present in the story, which otherwise would have ele be just solely kind of whimsical and romantic. I think Bertha's presence is this reminder that it's like the world is harsh and cruel and life is mean and people suffer. And I think that's, I think a big thing when I think of Bertha is I think of just what a tragic character she is. Yeah, I think I, I agree. And I think there's what the biggest thing that I was feeling kind of, again, that same moment you're having of like, I have to talk about this into a microphone on a podcast and I should <laughs> at least have cohesive thoughts. <laughs> There's this idea that I actually have been thinking about a lot recently. I I listened to another podcast called Hidden Brain, and it was about choices, and it was about the way that we see choices versus the reality of what those often actually are. And we we take these seemingly contradictory ideas, and we decide they're contradictory, and they can't both be true at once, and therefore we we hold them in complete separation. And I think that's what that quote at the beginning was talking about. Something can be problematic, analyzed, and enjoyed. Yeah. And I think it's the same way I feel about so many pieces of Bertha. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it's it's trying to solidify those into a single conclusion that is so difficult for me because she breaks my heart. Yeah. Bertha, may, if thinking about Bertha as a person, mm -hmm. and I don't like I don't birth is not based off of a specific real person, but women were kept in attics. Women were locked away for being insane. And it's debatable whether or not they were insane. Like she's not, not real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when I think too hard about her as a real person, it makes me a kind of sad. I can't wholly express. Totally. No, I feel that way too. And I think 
that's one thing that like, we're going to touch on this, but we're definitely not going to dwell on it because it'll just bring us all down. And this is supposed to be a fun podcast, but I feel you, Lillian, <laughs> especially like cards on the table. I'm having mm-hmm. kind of a gloomy day myself. And so mm-hmm. to especially think about these things, it's easy to really be like, wow, in a lot of ways, a lot of these things have not yet fully been resolved in our current society. Yeah. But um, we're going to analyze that and discuss it as we go. Well, and I think the other half of it for me, the other like conflicting idea is we're going to talk about this in a lot more depth as well. Mm -hmm. I think there's a way to read this that is just as true to me that is Bertha as a metaphor. Mm -hmm. And that reading brings me a really special kind of joy. Okay. That is like in the same way that like reading a tragedy can make you sad and happy at the same time because of the depth of human feeling. Like, Mm -hmm. I love readings of Bertha as a metaphor and as this like mirror to Jane Mm -hmm. and some of the other things we're going to speak in depth about. And I I have a lot of curiosity around that. Yeah. But I think my, the thing I feel like I'm going to talk about the most in this episode is ideas about Bertha Mm -hmm. that seem conflicting, but both feel true to me. Totally. Yeah. So with that amazing groundwork laid, kind of following our little uh, outline, because we structured this Mm. episode very specifically because we knew we're like, (laughs) we have big topics to discuss Uh here, so we need a guide. So the first thing that we're kind of going to start with is, you know, what do we know about Bertha based solely on the book? So I saw in your document, you had grabbed a few descriptions of her Mm -hmm. in the novel itself. So that was very helpful. Again, I'm going to kind of touch on before I dive into some of my initial notes about this Mm -hmm. is first of all, the first things that I'm going to be talking about are um, the ways that Jane has interacted with Bertha because she is our Mm -hmm. primary narrator. And so, but then later I'm going to be talking about, I think most of the information that we get about Bertha comes from when Rochester Mm -hmm. is giving his explanation speech. And when we get to that topic, I'm really going to emphasize the thing, okay, we have to decide as an audience, do we believe him? And also if we do, then we also must take into account his privileges, his biases, his emotional state, Mm -hmm. which could like for any human being cloud your judgment and change how you see somebody. So I think all of that will be very important. But with my initial stuff about kind of our like initial descriptions of what we get from Jane, I think Mm -hmm. my first note here is that after the interruption at the wedding has happened, Jane is already in kind of, I think, a frantic state. And as Mm -hmm. anyone would feel as she's being led up to this tower to like have this big, scary secret revealed, we have to know that she's going into this moment with a lot of fear and uncertainty and all of that. So I think that's something to keep in mind before about her mental state, potentially before we get these descriptions, because when we get the physical descriptions from Jane of Bertha, it's very animalistic the way she describes this Mm -hmm. other woman, specifically her, the fact that she's running around on all four. And then she describes her at one point as being like a hyena in like clothing when she stands up. And Mm -hmm. I know that this is something that you and I are going to talk a lot about is this kind of othering of a human being. (laughs) Uh And so right off the bat, I think we as an audience are supposed to be afraid and not see this person as a human being. So this Mm -hmm. is what's kind of given to us, first of all, before I keep talking, do you want to comment on that? I I absolutely love how you set this up. And I think before we go into that passage as well, I, her always, and I, I want to say the only time I felt gross about referring to myself as crazy <laughs> is for this episode, but I'm going to keep doing it because when I say it about me, it's with a lot of love. <laughs> if someone says it about me with not a lot of love, you're going to get a long lecture. <laughs> That's right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to fight you in a parking lot. I'm going to make you feel bad (laughs) on the inside. Even worse. (laughs) (laughs) Those scars don't heal. (laughs) I did math. Because why wouldn't I? I did what you did, which is like, how much of Bertha do we get that's not Jane thinking it might be a ghost Mm -hmm. and having these sort of like vague understandings of her. But after the moment where Jane knows Bertha exists, Mm -hmm. how much of Bertha is from Jane's perspective, Mm -hmm. which we can talk all day about how trustworthy of a narrator Jane is, but assuming that we trust Jane's firsthand experience and description of it Mm -hmm. with that mindset you have, I did math. So in total, Jane Eyre has 183,000 words, Mm -hmm. just a bit over that. The passage where Bertha is in the room. So Jane goes into the room to win Jane and Rochester and their uh, band of 
gentlemen, <laughs> leave the room, is 601 words, which puts it at 0.32% of Jane Eyre. Very small. If you remove the dialogue, which Bertha does not speak at all, mm-hmm. she literally does not have a voice in this, mm-hmm. that passage, descriptions of that scene is 315 words, which is 0.18% of the book. Our poor sweet girl. <laughs> Very small. Bertha is barely in this book, and yet she is the third pillar of yes. this three-person story. And yet she has inspired, like, so much analysis, debate, and criticism. And, yeah, so that's says a lot right there, right? Of, like, a character with no voice and that small of a presence can have that big of an impact. Wow. Well, okay, I think... I put those passages, we have a shared notes document on this one. I have my own separate notes document that's five pages. (laughs) But in that shared notes document, I have that passage. Do you want to read a chunk of that? I think I would rather kind of summarize some of the the things that stood out to me. Because that's what I was sort of doing when I was reading through those chunks is I was grabbing specifically keywords and descriptors, Mm -hmm. um, which Mm -hmm. I will do a lot more when we get to the Rochester section. Yeah. But when talking about from that scene, um, which thank you for finding that for us, what we get from Jane's descriptions is that in this present timeline of the novel, the way that Bertha is described is that she is a wild person. She's violent. She's emotional, distraught. And that is something that we can take as a fact. So this is right away. We've had this introduction of the otheringness of seeing her as kind of this animal. But then we do see how kind of, you know, violent and crazed she is she attacks rochester she needs to be bound down all this other stuff and so we do have this sense like anyone would see that without any context and you would be like yeah Mm -hmm. that's a crazy person Mm -hmm. but then we we as the reader who have finished the novel we have the context and we have i think as a reader the responsibility to ask certain questions and so one of the things that always comes to mind for this for me when reading this is like okay but imagine if you were put in a room where there's only one lantern Mm -hmm. hanging from a chain in the ceiling and you're not allowed to leave. And you were also taken from your home to a foreign cold country with a man who does not like you. Mm -hmm. How would you start behaving if that's the environment you were in? So these are, Mm -hmm. I'm going to constantly be being like, okay, so here's what we're given, but here's what we must consider about why she is the way she is. Your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I completely agree. And I think there's a few things that I want to talk about with that. But there's one thing that I, I warned you in advance I was going to talk about, which is the only description we get of Bertha. So we get these animalistic descriptions of her. Mm-hmm. The only description we get of her race is they describe her as Creole. Mm-hmm. That is an other. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk a little bit, not a lot. If that's something, if if Bertha's race is something and the othering and the inarguably racist connotations mm-hmm. of that, mm-hmm. if that's something you want to understand on a deeper level, genuinely, I highly recommend going and listening to that on-air episode. They have an understanding of the history of that and references that I do not and, and could not properly represent here. And there is that other resource. So I genuinely highly recommend that. Here's what I want to say, because because we asked several people for their input on this and a common response that we got and a response that I've seen in other places, Mm -hmm. a big debate about Bertha is, is she black? Mm -hmm. Maybe is the answer. Yeah. Because Creole is the definition Mm -hmm. that I found via the internet Mm -hmm. is a person of mixed European and black descent, especially in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So at a minimum... Creole is explicitly making her not European, Mm -hmm. is explicitly othering her, Mm -hmm. and it is explicitly removing her from whiteness. Mm -hmm. So our definition of white today is different Mm -hmm. from our previous definitions of white. For example, Italians used to very explicitly not be white, and today they would be considered white. Mm -hmm. The nuances of that (laughs) conversation I could go on for days about, Mm -hmm. and a few of my lovely friends and family, including but not limited to Piper, (laughs) have gotten long rants about that this week from me. Because it's a thing that that we should feel passionate about, but Mm -hmm. we are also... it matters. It does. It really matters. Like Lillian kind of said at the beginning of this section here, um, she and I are not experts on the history of this or uh, are qualified to appropriately discuss and dissect all of the nuances there, but it is very important to acknowledge culturally she is Creole, she is 
possibly black. And that is something that we have to acknowledge when talking about her. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because describing black people as animalistic Not cool. is a very, very harm, actively harmful, both in, both in the past and the future. Yes. Like it has, it has been really harmful. It is harmful today. Mm -hmm. And unless we actively combat that, it will continue to be harmful. Yes. So that's most of what I want to say about that. The last <laughs> note that I want to have on that is if, if you feel the need to say that Bertha is not black and that the reason and, and, or just not other. And your reason for that is because you feel that that then says that Jane Eyre is racist and is a racist text and therefore should be left behind. That's one of the reasons why I started with that quote at the beginning. I think it adds a layer of complexity and I have complex feelings about the book Jane Eyre in general, mm -hmm. because I think there is a lot of really important feminist messaging in here, but it is incredibly white feminism. Yes. And because of that, if you can't see it wholly in its complexity, there is a lot of other things in Jane Eyre that's racist. We've already <laughs> talked about the gypsy thing. There's just like a bunch of things in Jane Eyre that's racist. It's 1847 <laughs> British British society lady. Like slaves were still around at this time. Like the idea that these people weren't racist is buck wild to me. Yes. Yes. Anyway. So I mean that's <laughs> that level of intensity. People got like hours of me doing that this week. So that's my ta <gasps> most tamed down version of that rant. Amazing. I our listeners are unfortunate that they don't get the full undiluted potency if you want <laughs> the is... full undiluted potency <laughs> let me know i'll live stream that shit for sure amazing um okay so yes this very important uh detail has been addressed and we will be mm -hmm. keeping it in mind when we are continuing our analysis my next notes here lillian i jotted down other moments in the novel when Bertha has agency. Do you mm -hmm. mind if I talk about that real quick? Please do. Okay. So as we've said before, Bertha does not have any speaking lines. This is the only mm -hmm. scene where she is like, you know, the camera is on her. She's one of the main characters. If this is a stage, she's on stage and the lights are up. She's not just a shadow in the background. So I was like, okay, what are other moments in the book where Bertha has a physical like impact on the story where she's making decisions and she's like causing change. And so these moments that I jotted down, we have, of course, the first one, she slips out presumably because Grace Poole has gotten drunk and fallen asleep and she's very good at getting the keys and going out for a little escapade. So she's slipped out of her tower. <laughs> Which we're not, we're not going to talk about that, but that is one of my favorite like canon Grace Poole facts yeah. is just like casually Grace Poole is an alcoholic and everyone's fine with that. Well, I love, I was looking over this passage when Jane is talking to that innkeeper. He's like telling the story and he's like, yeah. he's like, oh yeah, she liked to take to the gin, but who wouldn't? It's a stressful life she leads. And it's just like, yeah, good point, sir. Well, and Rochester later is like, Grace Poole will do whatever I want her to for money. <laughs> I know. Oh my gosh. Okay. So moments of agency. So um, first Bertha slips out and she sets Rochester's bed on fire, um, leaving a candle in the hallway and laughing all the while, which, uh, and which awakes Jane. So that's the first thing is her trying to burn Rochester. Then we have her going into Jane's room and tearing the veil. And then we have after Jane has left, this is told to us again, we have to question narrators and everything is told to us by the innkeeper that it's suspected that she snuck out of her tower. And according to the book, she first burns the room right next to hers, but then she immediately goes downstairs and burns Jane's bed, not necessarily mm. knowing whether or not Jane is still there. And that's what sets the house on fire before she then jumps off the roof and takes her own life. So my, again, um, these, if without context, you could say, oh, well, that's the actions of an, uh, rather unstable arsonist. <laughs> <laughs> a rather, a rather unstable, unstable arsonist. arsonist. Can we call this episode Bertha a rather unstable arsonist? Yes, we can. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> but I am, when once again, putting on my critical hat, let's ask ourselves, why would someone do this? So I then said that all of Bertha's actions seemed to me fueled directly by Rochester's infidelity because she can see that her husband has not only, you know, locked her up here and all this stuff, but she can mm -hmm. see him actively trying to seduce this 18 year old child. And so mm -hmm. what would you do in her position? 
<laughs> light the house. Because here's here's one of the questions that I genuinely want our audience to think about. Because mm-hmm. I think you've thought about it and I've thought about it like so much. Yeah. Because a lot of times, and we're going to talk about this in a great deal of depth when we talk about Rochester's description and how much we can trust him and all of these other things. It's not okay to be violent against someone. I'm not arguing that you should. Mm-hmm. But I'm saying at some point, and somebody locking you in an attic is enough violence that you would be violent back. Mm-hmm. So my question is, what, at what point, if you were like maybe a little depressed and a little bit of a little hoe, you were out there <laughs> exerting a sexual freedom that you were not afforded, <laughs> would you, at what point would you start burning the house down? <laughs> Because uh, I would have done it well before birth. Yes. These instances we only get because Jane has got the house and she's what's like, you know, we're following her story. Mm-hmm. I wonder how often there were like moments prior <laughs> to her coming to Thornfield that maybe the the rogue arsonist was just doing her thing. In fact, it was, oh, I, I was thinking about this earlier. One thing that was a liberty that was taken, but one that I appreciate in Sang Deal, our Bollywood adaptation, is uh-huh. that when that Rochester gets attacked the first time, he has a remark uh-huh. when he's like, he's like, so what? It's happened to me so often. Like, I'm used to this. Yeah. This is my life of getting, like, bit and, like, punched by my <laughs> wife. And so he there establishes that this has been a recurring pattern before yeah. their Jane showed up. But that's one thing that I wonder, too, about this one. Yeah. And I also, I think, like, Because, and this is what I find so interesting, right? There's the unstable arsonist reading (laughs) where, which we're going to use a lot of words today that I are not okay words to use to describe people, Mm -hmm. but similar to the way we use gypsy, I don't want to associate currently mentally ill people with the description of this person. And so we're going to use the words they used, which are, I mean, again, like, If you describe me that way, for example, (laughs) we're going to have a long conversation around what a mental health looks like, and you're going to feel bad afterwards. Yes. (laughs) Like, is she a mad woman who locking her in the attic is the best choice because she is a risk to herself and others? Mm -hmm. Or is she a sane person who is being made to do mad things because of the circumstance. And one of my favorite things to do that thought experiment on is Mason showing up. (laughs) Because what happened in that conversation? Right. Mason shows up. He thinks his sister is stable enough that he can go visit her Mm -hmm. and doesn't need supervision from Rochester. Mm -hmm. There's two ways that happened. He goes up there. She's having a normal conversation with him. And then out of nowhere, she stabs him. And when the knife is taken away, she bites him. Mm -hmm. Now, I imagine if I was locked in an attic by a crazy man (laughs) and my brother came to visit me and I was like, oh, my God, thank God you're here. Let's go. Like, let's go. (laughs) I don't have any bags. Let's get out of here. You came to save me. And he was like, I'm just here to, like, check on you. Seems like you have a room and a roof. I don't know why you're complaining. I'm like, he literally never lets me out. I'm not even, like, allowed to walk on the grounds. He's like fucking this little 18 year old <laughs> outside the window like he's oh he's trying to seduce her so hard and i have to watch it all day because that's the only thing like there's no tv but <laughs> you just have to sit like, there and watch it happen <laughs> and then and then if he's like no like you're definitely staying here i'd be like okay i'm gonna stab you yeah. <laughs> it's like and then i'm gonna bite you i'm never gonna bite Oh man, I'm going to stab you. Yes, no, I feel that is justified. <laughs> it makes me think of, uh, I, I would be surprised if you can sympathize with this, Lillian, but it makes me think mm. of one of my favorite like genres of movie is actually, I love a kind of psychological thriller. Oh my God, I hate him so oh, much. Oh, I know. I, I knew you would. Um, So I don't want to watch a, I don't want a slasher. I don't want um like possession stuff, whatever. I mean, I will, I'll watch those things. But if I'm, <laughs> but if I'm seeking out like a, uh, a th- like a horror kind of thing for me, psychological mm-hmm. thrillers are what I love because it, they really evoke like very passionate emotions from me because they are this exact same situation typically where it's like, okay, you are a very, sane normal person but someone has all the power and they are like controlling you and there's nothing you can do and whenever i watch Mm -hmm. them i'm like biting a pillow and i'm like i hate this get out of there but like you can't do anything 
So yeah. oh, that's, I feel like what Bertha is probably feeling. <laughs> well, and it's like, and I think that is what is so compelling to me. It's those conflicting ideas of like, maybe, yeah. It could, either one of those with what we have in the text, mm-hmm. either one of those could be true. Now, what do I interpret it as and how do I read it? And when I'm looking at the book and how I feel about Rochester, I don't think that's what's happening. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's what Bronte intended, mm-hmm. but actually that brings up another point and then we can go into Rochester's stuff, mm-hmm. which is authorial intent, canon and death of the author. Yes. Because a lot of the conversation I've seen around Bertha is around what did like the, the Trump card that people pull out and all of that stuff is what did Bronte intend? And I think that's an interesting and important conversation, understanding what Charlotte Bronte was trying to do with this novel, Mm -hmm. how and why she did it, the context of the time, all of these other things. I think those are critical to a reading of the text. And we're actually going to do more looking into Charlotte Bronte's life Mm -hmm. in the new year. But I also think that it's important. I personally am someone who thinks that texts also live after the author is done with them. Mm -hmm. And can be interpreted with solely what exists in that book. And there are true readings that are not what the author intended. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. That can be a very complicated discussion in itself of Mm -hmm. um, just the way that art works. Like when you create Mm -hmm. it and like put it out there, then technically it belongs Mm -hmm. to the people because they can interpret things and take from it whatever they want. You cannot control what someone thinks of your own creation. So it is a very interesting discussion. But then, of course... Yeah, I've had my fair share of t- talks with certain purists and they're like, it's like, <laughs> this isn't the way it is. Stop with your fan fictions. I don't care who you ship. And I'm like, well, they're in love now and they can't stop me from writing the scene <laughs> where they're necking out for five hours straight. <laughs> okay, so that there's a there's a thing that I'm not sure all of our listeners are familiar with, but that as a fan fiction, a noted fan fiction author. Yes, indeed. You um, <laughs> are definitely familiar with that. I'm wondering if you could define for people, which is what is canon? And then what is another term that I use constantly all the time? Head canon. So canon is what appears on the written page or like in the script or on the screen, depending whatever the media is. That is mm-hmm. what the original creator created and put out there. Um, sometimes canon can also be like, oh, if they said in like, you know, well, I also wrote this or said in an interview that this is the thing that it is. So then that becomes canon technically. Head canon is whatever you, the audience decides to make of something. So like if you have this movie that you love, but it, the ending makes you really sad, then you can just be like, well, actually in my head canon, they ran away before the war happened and mm-hmm. it was great. Happily ever after. So like it can be sort of what you make up or like how you want to sort of interpret something. Yeah. And I think so like, you can have a headcanon that Bertha's super sane <laughs> and that Rochester is just a dick. Yeah. Like that can be how you, <laughs> and you can take all of the elements of the canon of the story mm-hmm. and then add your own layers of interpretation that she stabbed Mason because he wasn't there to rescue her. Mm-hmm. Which I think is justified. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, well, Your Honor, um, my mean brother came and essentially was just taunting me with his visit uh, because he was going to leave me there. So I think it's fine that I shed some blood just so he could feel what it feels like to be betrayed. And he's like, yeah, good. Fair point. Fair point. Well done. Solid point. (laughs) Okay. Are we going to talk about Rochester's story now? Fine. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so once again, very important, at least for me and how I interpret this, is this is his version of events. We never get mm-hmm. to hear Bertha's version. I also want to say going into this that everything that we've gotten of Rochester before this, he is also obviously a very complicated character. So mm-hmm. there are moments in reading Jane Eyre before the scene where I'm like, that's mean. And there's lots of moments before reading the scene where I'm like, oh, oh, I love him. He's so sensitive. He's wonderful. So you have to go into deciding if you're going to believe him, I think based on who you think he is as a character. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. So that makes me want to believe him. But then also, I, for me, again, it's that line about the other mistresses, that section (laughs) throws so much validity out the window for me for certain things Mm. because then I'm really like okay but also he is a desperate man who has lost all of his power so what do you do to try to save the situation you're gonna try and tell the most sympathetic story that you can I don't actually Mm -hmm. think that he's lying but I do want to say that I think 
his emotional state needs to be taken into account. And mm-hmm. also, like we've said before, his cultural and personal biases and all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Do you have thoughts on that before we kind of dive into his details? I have unlimited thoughts on that. And <laughs> we don't actually have 17 hours. So I think super high level. This is the same thing I said at the beginning. I think that it is equally true. I think Charlotte's intention is that we hear and understand and believe Rochester. Mm -hmm. I think that's her intention. I think he has a lot of really good reasons to lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that he is a rich white man. Yep. And that a lot of his criticisms of Bertha are shit he did. Yes. Yes. Yes, which we are going to really dive into here. So I have a few notes um, initially that just sort of describe like physical things about Bertha. Here are some things that I think we can, without a doubt, take as fact. Mm -hmm. So first of all, she is five years older than him. So we've got this age gap. It's not a big one, but it's still an age gap. And I think typically in this kind of like patriarchal society, the man is usually older than his wife. He is the, Mm -hmm. you know, with age comes experience and decision making, but here he is a guy. So he has that in his mind, like makes him like, oh, she's older than me, but I'm the guy. So what I say goes. I think he would probably I'm the man. man. Yes. I'm a man. I'm a man. See? This is is our man voices, so you must trust this more now. (laughs) Okay. So she is older than him. That is a fact. Mm -hmm. Bertha is also described in a couple of times that she, so she is a very, she's a big woman. I don't think this means like stout necessarily, but she can match Rochester's height and his strength. And so <laughs> that is like, that is one thing that Jane says is that she has like the same athleticism as him. So when he's grappling oh, with her, it's like hard for him to like keep this big, strong lady down. So she's mm-hmm. older than him. She can easily beat him in a fight. There's all this like kind of weird power dynamics, I think, right off the bat where he's expecting like a little Jane humble wife and he gets this strong older woman who's like, I don't think so, little British boy who I'm forced to marry. So here's some <laughs> You sweet. I'm now fully picturing a giant. Yes. I know you're supposed to be the same size, but I'm fully picturing Bertha just being like, Hi, you little sweet baby. Yeah, they just like push a little like elf in front of her and she's like, What's he that? Goes, <laughs> he goes, Please. Stop cheating on me and staring at me while you do. And she's like, no. No, I'm not going to (laughs) stop. It's just too much fun. (laughs) We then, at the beginning of Rochester's story, when he's first describing her, he does refer to her as beautiful when when they first met. Mm -hmm. He thought that she was attractive. She allured him. Yes. His specific description was, quote, tall, dark, and majestic. Mm -hmm. That is said in the same sentence in reference to her similarities to Blanche. Um, So by dark there, who knows what he's meaning, whether it's the Mm -hmm. color of her hair or what. But that is... Something that is said, and then almost immediately after when he's talking about why her family wanted to wed him to her, it says, quote, I was of a good race, unquote. And so there's another element for that kind of previous discussion that we had. Yeah, which of the I was of a good race, I do, my my copy of the book has annotations and I went and looked at those. I mean, it is what we, it's still the connotation we think it is, mm-hmm. but the, the use of that word mm-hmm. was a bit more expansive than we think of it today. So it's intended to be discussing his breeding. What? <laughs> um, and like, so it's not just his whiteness. Mm-hmm. It's also his connection to the British, British aristocracy. Good. Very important to note. Good. Okay. So I'm going to wrap, wrap and go through these little descriptions real quick. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when they met, she flattered him and showed off her charms and accomplishments, which back then accomplishments usually meant like, oh, she sang him some songs or she sat down and cranked out a sick piano solo. <laughs> or... She flashed up her skirt at him. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Whipped out a titty. Was like, check this out. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! My cow push me. <laughs> um, he said that she was admired by all of the men in her circle. He was dazzled. But then at the same time, he acknowledged off the bat that there, that she had no modesty, benevolence, candor, or refinement. So I want to mm. pause and discuss that real quick. One of these elements here that makes me think about at least... Bertha's mental state when they met, Mm -hmm. if she is able to come in 
and be like, hi, I'm beautiful. Here's my piano, like playing. Here's my painting. Here's my boob. Maybe not. Um, but then the fact that like in her, like the social circles that her family moves in, she is like admired and sought after, even if that is simply like, because mm-hmm. she's a beautiful woman still in society. Like you can't just be a crazy arsonist <laughs> like that. People are like, oh yeah, she's hot. I'm into that. So I, that says to me that she didn't start off as insane as we eventually see her. Yeah. And I think a lot of the conversation around Bertha, like pre being locked up, we're going to talk about after her and Rochester get together. Mm -hmm. But I think there's these, there's the two readings of Bertha, right? Like she's sort of running wild and like just out there doing whatever she wants. Mm -hmm. You can read that as pre crazy. Like nobody was even trying to control her. And she had these like, almost manic episodes Mm -hmm. like that's one option of reading it the other option is she was a woman in 1840s who had the gall to think that she could do what men do which is run around and fuck whoever they want exactly that is talked about later he has this line where he refers to her as intemperate and unchaste and and it makes me want to throw him off a building because i'm like you are that like you that's you (laughs) do you you remember that time you shot someone (laughs) who was sleeping with your girlfriend and how you like fucked your way across europe like and like clearly got drunk in front of jane when you like went on that rant well and and going into their relationship if that's where kind of we're we're headed towards Mm -hmm. when he talks about the fact that they couldn't sit calmly and have a nice evening together. That's another moment where I think there's two ways to read that one. She would lose her mind and like scream at him or like run around the table or like all these other things. But like, there's another one where it's like, he wanted to talk about like European philosophers (laughs) and like maybe the price of corn. Yes. Like maybe that's what he thought was like a cool thing to talk about. And she was like, Okay, well, like, did you hear like this hot goss from in the street? <laughs> like, maybe she, like, maybe she just was like, I, I bought this like really pretty new dress, or like, oh my god, I just like, I saw this guy like fully having sex with someone in the alley today. Like, that would be an inappropriate course topic of conversation, mm-hmm. but also super interesting. Yeah, right? no, like, seriously, like, they sound like it could be a reading where she was losing her mind Mm -hmm. in front of him and he didn't understand what that was and it made him scared Mm -hmm. and overwhelmed and he couldn't even be calm in his own home very sympathetic way to read what he's saying yes or i think an equally real interpretation is they just didn't have the same interests they just weren't into the same things and he was so uncomfortable in this foreign place where like the one of the things in the Hot and Bother podcast they talked about is like a reason white women and Creole women who were like who per- were perceived as white were considered like made crazy by the tropical climbs is sometimes they wouldn't wear shoes. <laughs> oh my god, there are so many like little things exactly, Lillian, that I. I just keep thinking about the restrictions against women in this time period. And yes, like, I agree with you. I feel as if Bertha comes across to me more than anything, like she was somebody who, and I'm going to circle back to this later when we talk about kind of like, where does Jane come into all of this? She was someone who's like, why should I sit still? Why should I do this bullshit? Like I see people Mm -hmm. out there, men doing these things. I'm going to do these things. And society was like, that's fucking crazy <laughs> and she was and she was rich mm-hmm. and single and she could. And could do what she wanted yeah and if we want to read so we're gonna hear in a, a moment and and i almost want to start talking about it now talk about her mother because if her that they one of the biggest things that people kept saying is like madness in three generations and i'm like okay <laughs> define that for yeah. me tell me tell me about what what about genetically passed on mental illness makes you think that we can just lock somebody in an attic because one time their mom did something crazy like because fun fact in case anybody's wondering how personally I feel about that I have madness going back for generations in my family and my grandfather was locked in an asylum Mm. so 
anybody who feel like I feel very similar, like people who got the race rant also got the crazy rant this week. Seriously, yes. No, that was one thing. Um, yeah, because we posted this question in a few places of being great like, grandfather. Sorry, not grandfather. Yes, of being like, okay, what? Well, how do you interpret this? And yeah, I saw that a lot too of people being like, oh, well, like it was her illness was hereditary, and I'm like, I'm not much of a scientist slash doctor. But also, I need to do some research before I really dev- dive into that statement. Well, and and here's the thing that I don't, this is not intended to be a criticism of any of our listeners or anybody who holds that opinion. Mm-hmm. Like, genuinely, like, that's one of the justifications given in the text. Yes. And a history of mental illness does mean that you are more likely to have mental illness. Mm-hmm. And there is real reason to believe that if, like, her mother had schizophrenia, for example, mm-hmm. she might be more likely to have schizophrenia. Yeah. Like, that is real. And the based off of the timing of this story, Bertha was probably about 27, 28 mm-hmm. when, she, when he, he got her diagnosed as insane. And that is when schizophrenia tends to show up, is in your 20s. Mm-hmm. So it's not... I'm not saying you can't read it that way. And I'm not saying that's not a a point in the column of crazy. Mm -hmm. But what I am saying is that doesn't actually fully dismiss any arguments towards just a free, bold woman. In fact, it reinforces that idea to me because if Bertha's mom was around when she was a teenager, for example, and taught Bertha to be a free spirit who didn't listen to men and then she got locked up because she was a free spirit who didn't listen to men and that pissed Bertha off, I would double down. Yes. Like, so I think it's, it's both are equally potentially true to me. Exactly. Yes. I think, uh, unless there's more details shared in those sections, I'm kind of inclined to share some of my, like, okay, we have this question, which whether or not it's the right lingo to use, uh, yeah. but like, is Bertha crazy or did the world society slash the men in her life, like label her that way and then make her crazy? I have written down kind of my answer. Are there more things you want to talk about in Rochester's descriptions mm-hmm. before we sort of discuss this? I think there's more we could talk about, but I think it's going to be the same conversation okay. again. Yeah. So if anybody, if you want to go read chapter 27 again, I did that this morning and it made me feel all of the feelings again. <laughs> so I'm going to just read what I wrote down aloud because, okay. uh, and then I'll kind of like pause and like reflect and see if I need mm. to articulate anything. But I said, okay, so given all of this information, I am inclined to believe that she wasn't necessarily quote unquote crazy at the beginning of his tale. Mm -hmm. I think that it's very possible that she might have had a mental condition of some kind that affected her moods, considering what we have, if we're to believe the truth, the truth or the facts, quote unquote, of like her sudden Mm -hmm. swing towards violence, you know, after they had been married and they were in this house together. But so much of what I see in their match is that they were 100% wrong for one another, which is Mm -hmm. what you and I kind of talked about earlier. From Bertha's perspective, she, yes, went from this kind of somewhat carefree life, doing what she wants, to now she's Mm -hmm. forced to marry this young, inexperienced, hoity-toity English dandy who looks down on her behavior and later actively detests her nature. Like, he is Mm -hmm. so disgusted. He, I think he uses that word, about just the way that she lives her life. And that in itself is cruelty, to, like, see someone Mm -hmm. as, like, that much, like, beneath you and wrong like i think he Mm -hmm. has some reference in the passage where he talks about like she was opposed to correction like he thought he's like oh i can like mold her and make her better fix her whatever (gasps) so gross no don't do that like just don't marry this lady obviously too late he didn't have any control over that situation but his attempt to control and influence as well as her lack of control over her own life Mm -hmm. and the impression the oppression of both society on women Um, And then what he did to her, what her family did to her, and just the men around her, Mm -hmm. I think, added to her declining mental state and contributed to her inevitable, like, kind of madness, quote unquote, and demise. Uh, Again, I just kind of finished by saying if Bertha had been a man in this time, instead of being called crazy, she would have been called a rake. And probably uh, the Brontes would write a romantic gothic novel all about her. (laughs) (laughs) But she would not have been labeled insane and she would not have been locked away. That is kind of where I come to yeah. with this. I I I think that's a, a wonderful summary of that. And I think, so this is a question that I roll around in my head a lot. Mm-hmm. And it, it has so many layers to it. And I don't have a great answer, mm-hmm. which is, 
I think I agree with all of that. I don't think that it's possible to really come to a hard conclusion on this. Mm -hmm. I think we can try to understand Bronte's intention. I personally think that she intentionally left a lot of questions open. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're going to do a whole episode on why Jane Eyre has been what Jane Eyre is and why all these adaptions and all of that stuff. That's going to be our one year anniversary episode. Yeah. little teaser. <laughs> but I think one of the reasons is the thousands of ways Bertha can be interpreted. Yes. And I think the two conflicting ideas that I have about her is that she is simultaneously a tragic figure who could be someone with, like you said, those underlying potentials that gets locked in an attic and fully loses it Mm -hmm. and isn't treated like a person. So she stops acting like one and it just exacerbates that, exacerbates that. But I also don't know that that makes Rochester a terrible person. Like, I think that's one of the things that I found so as like another common thread in that discussion, Mm -hmm. which is, well, what else was Rochester supposed to do? And all these other things. And like, that's, that's, the discussion of Jane Eyre exactly. is so interesting because we've been talking about Bertha taking her outside of it, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's so interesting. And like we talked about with Canon before, like there's this very controversial book that we are definitely going to read, which is Wide Sargasso. Uh, Wide See? Sargasso. See? Um, sure. Yeah. That that you know I'm great at reading stuff <laughs> and. That is a tale from Bertha's point of view, and people have a lot of criticisms of it because it is often treated like canon when it isn't officially canon, Mm -hmm. and it's, I think of it as the Wicked to the Wizard of Oz, Jane Eyre's Wizard of Oz, where it's like, I don't know that it's true. I wouldn't (laughs) say it overrides Jane Eyre, but I think it it has, seems to have the potential for truth in it. Um, Anyway, the... The point that I'm making is I don't know that Bertha being tragic Mm -hmm. and society and potentially even Rochester exacerbating or even triggering Mm -hmm. her madness, Mm -hmm. using their words, makes him a bad person because the other options, as many of our listeners pointed out, sucked. Mm -hmm. They were bad. Yeah. The mo the the only piece that makes me go now this is assuming he's not fully gaslighting her, but he's instead like doing his best to take care of her because like he says he wouldn't be cruel to her, so like point in his favor there, but point against everybody else for being like just beat her, it'll be fine. <laughs> he did do something deeply selfish in keeping her there that definitely damaged her mental health, which was hide her. Yeah. I think that's one thing when thinking back, um, because I didn't re-listen to it, but I remember from the on-air episode where they talked about this, is how kind of cruel it is to take her away from her home and her family and everything that Mm -hmm. she knows. To go from Jamaica to the cold, dreary like location of this spooky old locked up quiet manor house in the English Mm -hmm. countryside where she doesn't know anybody and she's assigned one like cranky old drunk who's going to take care of her. Uh Like that would, even if you were a sane person and that was like your fate, that feels like you're Mm -hmm. getting sent off to prison. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. That I think that's, that said a lot too. I also want to say, cause I, I like that you mentioned, you know, given all this information, regardless of what we think is Rochester, a good guy, a bad guy. I, in kind of going through, my sort of like how do I decide how do I personally interpret like Mm -hmm. Bertha's state that given all of that info um I mean this is Bertha's episode not necessarily Rochester's episode Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I even though I see it that way I don't think Rochester is a is a cruel man I think he is Mm -hmm. also a product of this society he grew Mm -hmm. up with a very awful sounding father and a very cruel brother and so he's his influences are other cruel men who try to control not only women, but just everything in their lives. And so these are his influences. Mm -hmm. And eventually, obviously we then get his philosophy of like the society that breeds these people, these actions, these ways of thinking um, and supports them that he detests. And I think that whether or not we are taking his story, um, you know, for truth, or if there's some embellishment there to persuade Jane, I think there's so much that, 
prevails when he's telling the tale of that that's sensitive man that we do love, mm-hmm. um, where I think especially it hits when he's kind of describing his sorrow of being stuck in this house when he can hear her screaming just in the other wall and he like kind of contemplates death. And I think yeah. there's a quiet suffering there and you do get the sense that he's really kind of trying as best as this man can. And so, yes, opposed to locking her in an asylum or other kind of things that he could have done, she does have a personal caregiver. I do think that he is trying his best, but he's Mm -hmm. still part of this potentially kind of like, you know, flawed system that doesn't have the resources to help these people the way they should be helped. And that's not his fault. Yeah. And I think that even the idea, because while I was listening to that episode, I don't think that episode's perfect. I think their their interpretations just add another layer of understanding that was helpful to me Mm -hmm. because I felt like yelling at them, like while they were doing this, I'm like, I don't disagree that Rochester is an embodiment in this story of colonial white British privilege Mm -hmm. in a gross way that I don't enjoy. Mm -hmm. But he's also a sweet little bean who hates that society. Yes. And, but yet can't see it in the complexity of how that society is damaging Bertha. And in the same way that we all have these preconceived notions that we have to unpack him bringing Bertha back to Thornfield was inarguably not the best thing for her, mm-hmm. but he didn't know better. Mm-hmm. And he like leaving her with a caretaker in Jamaica might've been better for her and her going, him going back or being a, a whore around Europe. Sorry. <laughs> not whore is a bad word. Cause I don't want to, but the man's, um, <laughs> but be uh, just like slutting it up around Europe. <laughs> like that's, I think that's a better choice to do that. But he didn't think that, and society at the time didn't think that. They thought that Britain was like the creme de la creme of the world, and who wouldn't want to be here? <laughs> um, many people, it turns out. Yeah. But it's, in some ways, there, the interpretation of his actions at the time would have been worse mm-hmm. if he had paid someone there to take care of her and left her behind and abandoned his wife. Yeah, he kept her close. To some Which extent, it was worse. Yeah. but mm-hmm. under, but like he put her up in a castle <laughs> in the attic. <laughs> Do you want to discuss this idea that you touched on before of mm-hmm. Bertha as a metaphor versus a active player in the story? Yeah, because I think. And I think that leads into the next thing on our list as well, which is parallels between Jane and Bertha. Mm-hmm. So my favorite reading of Bertha. And I think there's a lot of arguments to be made in the way the story is laid out, because it's something we talk about when we talk about adaptions a lot. We talk about Rochester. This is Jane's story. Mm -hmm. It's not Rochester's and it's not Bertha's. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Bronte is even trying to represent Bertha's story. And that's not to say that people in Bertha's position don't deserve to have their story told. Mm -hmm. They absolutely do. This is just not that. So knowing that and knowing that it's Jane's story, Mm -hmm. if we see Bertha not as a person, which makes me want to cry all the time to think of her as a person, Mm -hmm. but as a narrative mechanism, Mm -hmm. there's so many pieces of evidence that she is this almost extension of Jane's personality that has to be killed off in order for Jane to be happy. And the ways that a woman has to be this tamped down version of herself, there's that parallel between her being locked in the red room at the beginning and Bertha being locked in the attic, like all these things, I think really support the idea that Bertha is in so many ways, a metaphor for a part of Jane. Yeah. Is that your favorite way to interpret her in the story overall? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, and it also makes me wonder about what other points mm-hmm. Bronte was trying and arguably in some ways failed to make mm-hmm. by having Bertha be this other. Yeah, right. As almost a, if Jane had been in Jamaica, if Jane had been around people, had a mother who encouraged her to be frantic mm-hmm. and, and free and this wild spirit instead of having a Miss Temple and a Helen who tempered that. 
I what would she be? Exactly. One of my main notes here, which is exactly what you're saying, is that Bertha is, I think, an example of what Jane could have become, like you just said, mm-hmm. if she didn't have these influences. But I also made note that it wasn't just like the influences of like having a temple and a Helen, but Jane also had certain privileges that mm-hmm. enabled her to step away from this. It allowed her to escape the hardships of that life. And Bertha never had those privileges that gave her that mm-hmm. opportunity. And there's discussions of race and class and all kinds of different things um, that are involved in that. But I, there's so many things. I think I remember when we were in one of the book episodes where Jane is walking around on like the, the same floor. She doesn't realize we mm-hmm. having known the story, we know she's walking mm-hmm. around the same area where Bertha is currently locked away. And it's in that moment when she's walking back and forth on that, that floor of the estate that she's longing to be free. Little does she mm-hmm. know there's a woman with even less freedom, just a few feet away from her. And I think there's so many beautiful moments like that where you're like, wow, where is Bertha right now when Jane is experiencing this thing? And how does her experience mm-hmm. compare? I, I love, I'm all for metaphor. I really like that too. Mm-hmm. I think given at least how I feel right now today in this moment, mm-hmm. having done this deep analysis of what I feel about this character, I think I personally don't want to remove Bertha's humanity because I think she's already mm. had so much taken away from her. Um, so I don't want to remove her humanity by placing um, the role of simply being a metaphor or simply being like a roadblock that's just meant to be this like tension between uh, Jane and Rochester's happily ever after, which I think she is all of those things. But I, as a reader, will always want to personally mm-hmm. see her as the person that is Bertha And to understand that kind of what I touched on in the beginning is I think she's meant to come into Jane's life at this moment, right when she thinks, oh, like I finally had my happily ever after. Mm -hmm. And this kind of mirror is held up to say, don't forget about the people who can't have this ever. Don't forget about the suffering of others and the, you know, there's mental illness in the world. There's injustice for women. There's all of these things. Like you're about to go off and do this thing, but these things still exist and they always will, at least for now. (laughs) Um, So I think there's elements of that, that, that Bertha kind of represents. Um, So not to be super sad. (laughs) No, I think that's so interesting because I think in some ways adding her as this literary narrative like making her this narrative element instead of this like stripping away some of the humanity and making her this narrative element and we're going to talk about this this is going to be probably our longest episode by good distance boys and girls sorry about (laughs) it but not that sorry but we're going to talk about those but I think I don't I don't think it stops being that Mm -hmm. I don't think she stops being a person and she stops being that reminder by making her this reflection of Jane and what it's making me think of that I it's it's my it's a fresh new thought hot take coming out right now from the oven <laughs> of Lillian's brain. <laughs> but so one of the things that I I don't properly know the right terms for, but the 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 specific wording that she uses to describe the floor that Bertha is on, I believe they say like the third floor or the attic or whatever it is, is a way that people at the time would metaphorically refer to their minds. Yeah. So if we make Bertha a manifestation of some of the thoughts in Jane's mind and a personification of that. Mm -hmm. That is for real, like a thing I do with my own depression. Yeah. Like that is, that is a thing that I have, that I've been told to do because anxiety, depression, other stuff about my brain. One of the ways to like kind of clean out your own thoughts about it and manage that Mm -hmm is to separate yourself from those anxious, depressive thoughts Mm -hmm. and manifest them and personify them as this other being. Mm -hmm. And I think that to me, it, it, you're right in that it, it takes away from Bertha's agency and Bertha's separateness as this other person. And it leads to problematic readings of like, you're, you're making her this other. So your, your crazy is this other. And what does that mean? What's the point of that? And all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But I also think it is that problematic thing, but it is a, a really interesting reading to me because 
that adds a layer of complexity to the ending that I love as well. Yeah. Which is if that is a part of Jane, if that is a part that she has locked away, Mm -hmm. that society has forced her to push into a corner and to keep away from herself. And she almost dies staying away from Mm -hmm. if that part has to die, if that part of her has to die in order for her to get a happy ending with Rochester, what does that mean? I know because like, that's the whole thing is that like, I loved, again, we're going to talk about this so often of like the on air podcast. One of the ways that they kind of structured their discussions is this idea of like passion, like where are their moments of passion? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that's one of the defining characteristics of Jane is that she Mm -hmm. is this passionate individual. I think it's her passion and spark of life that initially draws Rochester to her because he sees that and he's like, Mm -hmm. whoa, like people aren't like that. Like, I wish they were, but here you are doing this thing. And so, yeah, to have to tamper certain things, like I don't know. I think it's almost like society wins a little, yeah. but also she gets to be with the man that she loves. Um, so she also wins a little. So yeah. as we've been saying this whole time, it can be both, right? It doesn't have to yeah. be a win or a lose or a, a black or a white. It can be a matter of people are calm very complicated, just like ogres and onions. We have layers. Absolutely. <laughs> that, honestly, we've talked about it before. We'll talk about it again. The most important piece of cultural media is Shrek. Any year <laughs> of any generation is the OG Shrek. <laughs> We will never not bring that up. Always relevant, guys. <laughs> Bronte had a dream about an ogre, and she's like, you know what? I'm just going to write Charlotte. I'm going to write Jane instead. Yeah, she was like, this, this has been, Shrek has been set to people in visions for generations. <laughs> and the team in 2001 was just the first bravest people. I was going to say, they finally that. did it. <laughs> oh, my God. Amazing. Oh. Anyway, are we, are we ready to talk about adaption versus? Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to we're going to do a little to cleanse ourselves from this very deep in-depth discussion of Bertha. I'm going to once again make Piper look at a bunch of pictures and tell me who's in those pictures. This will be hard so, since I don't know any of these women's names. <laughs> I well and you, so that's what, I think you can just go with the adaptation. You do know one of these women's names. Okay. But just go with the adaptation that they're from and I think I don't expect you to get nearly as many as our Rochesters, but starting again, we're going to read it across. So any, any listeners who are watching this on YouTube, this has also come up on your screen. Congratulations. So upper left-hand corner and then kind of across and then down. Okay. I'm going to spare people my stuttering and just filling of like empty sounds and just say, okay, number one, don't know. Number two is, um, wait, if you don't know, let me read the answer. Okay. Then go ahead. I don't know that one. So it's, that's the 1970s with right standing right behind her is our, our George C. Scott. Oh, very nice. Okay. So the next one is the 2006. Nope. 2011. Oh, okay. Um, the next one is that, uh, Sangdale. Yep. Okay. The eighties for the next one. 73. I don't know, dude. Um, <laughs> the the black and white one on the top is um, from the guy with the weird smile? Yes. Okay. That's the 52 TV movie. Okay. Then we've got um, the stage version. Uh, the National Theater. Yeah. Yep. And then we've got um, uh, 73. That's 2000. Or that's 1996. 96. Okay. Then we've well, got the other TV black and white movie. Yes. The 94 she's one of she's looking out of a window she's one of our best okay i don't know the next one that's second city tv okay um and then we've got uh 2006 2006 okay then we've got um snl my Maya rudolph yes yep then i i should know that is that 80s no yeah that's 83. okay that's 83 okay got it cool um this one i don't expect you to get i have no idea that's the 2013 musical. That is the only second that she's on screen. Amazing. Um, the next one is probably the first uh, one with sound. Yep, the 34. Okay. And I for sure know this one because I remember that she was like an insanely busty lady. This is Syrian Hines' very own Bertha. Yes. <laughs> she's looking at him and shaking her titties at him. And he's so like, he's like, no, Bertha, not right now. These Later. next two you got to get because they're much bigger than the other ones. Um, probably one of my favorites is the one with Orson Welles. 
And then the one with the uh, drunk guy and the chains. Yeah. Yay. The 57 TV movie. <laughs> so She's fun. attacking him. <laughs> the only time she's on screen is when she's actively attacking him. Amazing. Very cool. Anyway, so this will be on with our answers again. I just wanted to show you one more thing. <gasps> this is the 52. Amazing. Oh, my God. <laughs> she's the lady I from Everyone Loves Raymond. IMDb. She's the woman from Everyone Loves Raymond. That's amazing. Yay. What a legacy. <laughs> I went to find her name and she fully had an IMDb page, which like most of the old time TV ones, I can barely find their names. Mm-hmm. I have way more missing Bertha names than anything else. So if you have any of the actresses names that I'm missing, please let me know. But dude, this was I fully gasped. Phenomenal. I love it. <laughs> So let's talk about our thoughts on adaptions. How did you organize your thoughts on adaptions or did you? Um, I simply made a note of there are two versions that stand out to me where I feel Mm. I like what they did with it. And then I've just got general thoughts about the others. Okay. So my two versions that stand out to me is I'm like, I like what they did with this. I've said this a thousand times. I don't need to Mm -hmm. like spend a a long time on it, but Mm -hmm. probably my favorite because it really captures, I think, the the tragedy and the sorrow that Mm -hmm. evokes a lot of emotion for me and Bertha is the version with George C. Scott, the way that we see her and the way that he reacts, Mm. interacts with her. That is number one for me (gasps) for Bertha portrayals on screen. Yeah. It's just, it's so sad. Um, but she's so sad. and I feel like that's a version that doesn't other her. She just seems like a tragic woman. And you really mm-hmm. then that gets down to the the nitty gritty of the debate, the moral debate that I think is so compelling about this is the idea mm-hmm. of, yes, what happens when you have to care for a mentally ill individual and how hard mm-hmm. that is and how do you deal mm-hmm. with it? So I think that version really perfectly captures that. What did you write down in your little note for the George C. Scott version? I wrote ghost and sad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Quite sad. So, because I think the way that I want to talk about this, and we'll talk about this, I want to hear the other one that you have. And I want to talk about how and why I like the different ways Mm -hmm. that we can sort of categorize these interpretations and these, the ways that birth has been brought into these adaptions. Yeah, totally. So what's the other one that you have right now? The other one, even though I said earlier, like I'm obviously very compelled by the idea mm-hmm. of um, uh, her as the metaphor. Um, I think yeah. the way that does that in such an intriguing way. And I, I applaud someone who has the the courage to do like a kind of off-brand interpretation. Not that this is off-brand, mm-hmm. but we hadn't seen a movie do this until the Orson Welles one where yeah. she's, you don't even really see her if it, maybe there's like a flash for a moment. But the fact that she's simply this horrifying thing in the shadows, then it's kind of, I was like, that is very intriguing. And I think that's a cool choice. Yeah. So the the 43, I'm not going to go into all of this, but I learned a lot about the making of the 43. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it was Tracy, actually, um, the author of a book that we're also going to talk about here in a second, um, Mr. R, who said... who who let us know that I couldn't find sources to exactly back this up, but as far as I can tell, it's true Mm -hmm. that there were censorship laws and rules in the UK at the time that you were not allowed to depict madness on screen. Really? And so that's one of the reasons they did it that way was they literally couldn't put a mad woman on screen. Weird. That's so interesting. Yeah. Well, that I know. It, it, that's interesting. It kind of takes away the creative um, uh, bite, but, but still. But I also think, I don't think it takes away from the creative bite. I think in some ways it adds to it because it it makes the 34 interesting to me in a way as well. Um, it also makes it clear as to why like the 52 and the 49 would have such a prominent Bertha mm-hmm. when these had such a, a, a non-existent Bertha. Yeah. Um, But I think it, once again, like we talk about these being products, not only of the book and in conversation with each other, but of the time that they're in. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's interesting to think about the progress, progress that was made in the hundred years between the book and that adaptation was, let's just pretend crazy people don't exist. (laughs) Yeah, my gosh. No, that is like a a commentary in itself. Of like, how do we still approach mental illness? So yeah, bizarre. One of the things that I found interesting as I went through all 22 different Berthas that we had is um, one of the bigger conclusions was I thought I would have ones where I was team Bertha and then team Rochester. And that would be like, Rochester was like totally valid in all his choices. Here's the thing that I found most interesting as I reflected on that. Mm -hmm. I only find Rochester treatment of Bertha as like pro Rochester if 
I am also compelled by Bertha. Mm-hmm. If I see Bertha as a person and and see her as this like more compelling version and all of that stuff, I can then see Rochester's potentially good treatment of her mm-hmm. as good as well. So I have very mixed feelings about the 73 and the 83. Mm-hmm. I think both of those were the truest to the book mm-hmm. in terms of their adaptations. But I didn't feel compelled by Bertha. I didn't feel a huge amount of sympathy for her. It did seem, I did feel sad. Yeah. But I I also then didn't think that Rochester's treatment of her was great. Right. I'm curious as your thoughts on that. Yeah. I mean, neither of those Berthas had a big impact on me. Because again, Mm -hmm. I think those are versions that even though, yes, they are very true to the books, I think the people creating the stories are kind of, using her as sort of a sensationalist, um, Mm -hmm. like, wow, look at this audience kind of a thing. And so Mm -hmm. the way they appear on screen doesn't stand out to me in like super significant ways. Um, And that's kind of how I feel about a lot of Bertha's because I feel like we see her very briefly and she's either insanely wild and crazy Mm -hmm. or she's just kind of like a sad woman who's like sitting there. Yeah. So some of the ones that I had written down as her as a real person, the uh, 34 version hilarious Mm -hmm. she's just a kooky aunt (laughs) who walks downstairs and he just is like the fact that he's trying to divorce her pisses me off (laughs) like just the whole way they do Bertha I'm just sort of like what what was your like what did you think was going to happen now you were going to make her not animalistic you were going to give her very dark eyeshadow Mm -hmm. and then we were going to be okay with the fact that he was divorcing her well I just love in that case like if it's a matter of like divorce is an option which in the novel it's simply not if this lady is like actually just like she's not crazy she's just like weird and so they're like he's like sign the divorce papers damn it and she's like never you're stuck with me (laughs) (laughs) so just like that was but she also is like clearly in up with him because she's like oh my god we're getting married again yeah it's like jesus christ (laughs) so i think that's one of the like simultaneously least accurate most real person and also what did you think you were doing amazing is how i feel about that one but um the other two two ladies that i'm a big fan of and i think the the 49 really takes it for me is the 49 and the 52 they're just out here (laughs) cause of chaos <laughs> they're unstable arsonists and i'm proud of them for Yay, it Yay, <laughs> unstable arsonists they're probably more closer to this um what if bertha that we've been discussing of like she was a party girl and just didn't want to uh-huh. be saddled to this like sad little Br- british nobody and so now mm-hmm. she's like she's like well if i'm gonna be here i'm still gonna fucking party <laughs> and so uh-huh. let's do it so the one i think uh 57 bertha has a similar level of of crazed i think she is also similarly very accurate to the book um however i am very pro bertha in that adaption Mm -hmm. which that's she's only on screen to attack a man i hate um (laughs) but the 52 sing sing dill i want to talk about a little bit because you mentioned your thoughts on her and like the way that i think he it's a very interesting portrayal of bertha i think it's relative to some of these a relatively accurate portrayal of Bertha Mm -hmm. but there's two big factors that I think make it very different one Singdell was meant to be accurate to the time Mm -hmm. which means that is supposed to take place in 1952 name of city in India Mm -hmm. um, which is very interesting to me and the other thing that I hadn't thought of until this episode and I'm curious as to what your thoughts are is they remove all of her otherness because she is a member of the culture this movie is taking place in. Mm-hmm. And I found that a, as a really interesting like thought exercise. For sure. It's one of the reasons why I'm really excited when we eventually get to watch more versions from different countries of this story. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, if, you know, there's no otherness, it's simply he's married to like a violent, unstable lady who, mm-hmm. as he said, frequently like bites and beats him up and he's not Mm -hmm. a fan of it (laughs) yeah then i think it's just a matter of i don't know spousal abuse and yeah i can get wanting to take solace that makes the um the bigamy a lot more kind of understandable and it's like yeah dude you're getting abused by this mean lady like sure go off with your your governess have have a good time go find some peace (laughs) two other adaptions that have similar beats to them are not the same, but the 96 and the 2006 mm-hmm. both have Bertha's where I feel like Rochester is treating her relatively well. Mm-hmm. And she also seems like she's 
mad woman who's being cared for in the best way possible. We get a lot more of her backstory in the 2006 than we do in any others. Mm -hmm. But I think similar to so many other things I feel about the 2006, I think they interpret her really differently. They represent her really differently. But I think they do a better job of getting across to a modern audience the intentions that Bronte had. Exactly. That is one. I I had my other note about the 2006 one because the way that we see her in her fancy little apartment um, is Mm -hmm. nothing like how the scene is described in the novel. So if you are a purist Mm -hmm. and you see that, you're like, what the hell? Where's the woman running Mm -hmm. around on all fours? This is a fine Mm -hmm. lady. Um, So that is very different. But I think that is a good example, yes, of the creators saying, how are we going to use this character to get the points of the story that we want to communicate across. So we're going to actively Mm -hmm. show her sleeping with another man and looking at Rochester while she does it, because people nowadays would be like, whoa, a bit too far, lady. That's kind of mean. And she's like, hey, fuck you. And so we're like, 2006, we don't know what Gen Z would think about it. (laughs) Yeah, who knows? We are old at this point. Maybe (laughs) Gen Z is like, why didn't he just like get up get up in there yeah just join them like her eye contact was clearly an invitation to get in (laughs) something that both piper and i are so totally down with other people participating in if they want to but i know for a fact is not something piper is interested in is polyamory (laughs) why couldn't they have just had a discussion about ethical non-monogamy there you go man let's just sit down and talk about it (laughs) open partners (laughs) we already talked about the 97 wild interpretation when siri and hines goes bad Mm. (laughs) um but the 2011, I think, is also equally, like, feels really true. Yeah. It doesn't quite make Bertha very animalistic. Mm-hmm. But I think one beat around that that I thought was particularly true of the way they portrayed that moment is that moment is not about Bertha. That moment is about Jane. Yeah. We can he- sort of hear this, like, distortion of sound as Jane is having this moment of, like, panic that leads her into those next moments. So yeah. I don't know that I love this portrayal of Bertha, but I think it is a really great representation of Jane Eyre in that that those beats are about Jane. And in the book, they're about Jane. Yeah, I, I really liked that scene too. That's in probably my top three. I liked that instead of having her like, you know, running around and physically being like wild that way, they portrayed kind of more of a disturbed sort of crazy. Mm-hmm. The fact that she has this windowsill full of dead flies. And then when she goes up towards mm-hmm. Jane, she Ooh. spits a dead fly at her. Like yeah. that yeah. is a very creepy, gross way to show someone who is unhinged instead of just like, I'm a wild animal. And so, and then, <laughs> well, and they have that beat that I love so much, which is like, Rochester is kind of hold like she goes up to kind of get this physical comfort from her him Mm -hmm. and she he sort of like gives her that and then when she tries to go after Jane he knows like you can see the way that that scene could have gone with Mason right where it's like Mason saw her coming at him and thought that it was she was just gonna be normal and then she attacked (laughs) and Rochester is like nope you're gonna attack Jane I can tell from the 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 hate in your eyes Mm -hmm. so i'm not gonna let you do that (laughs) (laughs) yeah i like the way that she goes from yeah that kind of moment of comfort to then suddenly like against him Mm -hmm. so that was good Mm -hmm. which i thought was done really well um two other so a a way of portraying bertha that we've talked about and we talked about that a little bit with the 43 but i think a way of making her just kind of like this haunting person is both the 94 and radio adaption and the national theater adaption. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought those both did a really good job of having her kind of like Bertha woven in throughout yeah. in a way that made her feel more like a reflection of Jane and Jane's experience. Yeah. Um, but they did it a little bit differently as well. Mm-hmm. Thoughts on that? Um, just to reiterate stuff that we said during that episode that she was, that was beautiful visual storytelling, mm-hmm. the way that Bertha kind of sings throughout the entire thing, you know, hands articles of clothing to Jane and the way all of that symbolism that we've gone into before 10 out of 10. Mm-hmm. Love it. Yeah. And I, I think there's one of the things that um, I don't feel is true of the 94 that I did feel was really true of the, national theater production is that they did this incredible job of making Bertha the most human Bertha I've seen. And yet also the most reflection uh, and ethereal um, metaphor for Jane that I've seen as well. Yeah. Something that we don't have a ton of time for, but I think is also interesting and you can go back and listen to our episodes in more depth on those specific adaptions or really interpretations of the story. Mm -hmm. 
is um, the three main sort of like quote unquote modern adaptions that we have of Jane Eyre is the 2013 um, web series mm-hmm. where Bertha is not on screen at all. Allison actually talked about that and about how that would be probably the the only thing she knows they would want to change yeah. is giving Bertha's story a bit more light and a bit more um, screen time. Mm-hmm. And then the interpretation of B and Reluctant Immortals, mm-hmm. I think, is really interesting to all the things that we talked about. Again, I think there's nothing that directly contradicts what is in that book. Yeah. And yet I don't interpret Bertha that way. Right. No, it's cool seeing other people exactly take something and do something with it. I am personally, mm-hmm. for the most for, for the most part, um, when it comes to things that I'm a fan of, I like uh-huh. seeing it done in different ways. I'm not yeah. so much of a, a purist when it comes to stuff where it's like, don't touch mm-hmm. the source material. You can't do it unless you do it exactly the way it was. Uh-huh. I like seeing something being like, okay, like what about this? But we're going to do it this way. Put it in a different time period. Put it in a different setting. I'm going to switch genres around. I think that's exciting. And it's a cool way to show how much you understand the source material. Um, I think it's worth mentioning and we obviously talked about this in the episode itself, but it was very, I thought, a good kind of like way to bring her mental illness to the, the 21st century uh, for in the um, the YouTube version. Is, oh, the YouTube version. And the YouTube version was by saying that not only did she maybe have, you know, some like mental illness already, but then there was mm-hmm. this kind of element of postpartum depression and mm-hmm. how that contributed to it. And I thought that was a great way to kind of add in to the very sympathetic and kind of real yeah thing um that people can connect to and feel about so great job there. yeah and then the last one that we'll talk about before we do a very nice little send-off conversation that'll be short i swear thanks for being here with me <laughs> is mr r and the representation of birdie tracy really broke my heart she hurt me a lot with that one i'm still sad yeah no that i thought about that a lot when i was writing this stuff and i think she did an incredible job of taking like we've said what is a character that has so little actual page time, but such a big impact and to Mm -hmm. dissect that character and yeah, do what she did with her. And so, yes, if you care about Bertha, you need to read Mr. R. We have an episode all about it. Uh, It's a very interesting deep dive into this character's origin story, but in a modern ish setting. Yeah. I don't want to spoil that for you. We had a pre spoiler discussion uh, as the first half of that episode. So if you want to know more about that book, you can go back and listen to that episode. Yeah. But really, really interesting to think about those very different interpretations of Jane Eyre whilst doing our deep dive into Bertha. Um, but Piper, do you want to tell people what we're going to end on? So we end on a little happy note and send people off with a smile. <laughs> uh, Lillian found for us to finish on this wonderful video on YouTube that someone made uh, that is taking Bertha, but what if she was a Disney princess? And in mm-hmm. fact, it is like the exact same score as When Will My Life Begin from mm-hmm. Rapunzel or Tangled. Um, and except they've changed the words uh, for Bertha and that there's a beautiful music video that accompanies it. It's very funny, very clever. Um, and I, I enjoyed it a whole lot. It was great. And if you don't want spoilers from the music video from like 10 years ago, pause <laughs> here and go watch it. But um, I was like, I had found this months ago when I was doing other research for other things and just like dropped it in a drive was saving it for this episode. And then I watched it and had this incredibly pleasant surprise of our good friend, Allison was on at the end. Yes. And I was like, Allison, what are you doing here? The woman who played Jane from the uh, audio autobiography of Jane Eyre. So I was like, whoa, mm-hmm. fun. And I love that. So her cameo was literally supposed to be that she is also watching this YouTube video. <laughs> and like, as she's sitting there being like, this is crazy. There's a pause. And then she later says, subscribe. Like she goes like, I, <laughs> interpret that as her being like i'm totally following bertha's channel (laughs) like i'm gonna learn it's creepy that she knows where i am but the song was good (laughs) oh i loved it it was very clever so you definitely check that out if you like bertha and i i would recommend saving it for yourself as a little treat when you're crying after reading mr r um and the bertha beats this yes (laughs) yes but yeah it i is there anything else we want to say about bertha anything else we feel the need to discuss here. I think we've covered everything. I've said all the emotional stuff I need to say. I think my only wrap up is simply that I think it's so impressive that 
this character can inspire this much conversation Mm -hmm. because it's not just our podcast in this one episode. It's so many. We're the only ones who's ever thought (laughs) it's the Facebook fan page that we're a part of. It's the community all over the world. It's all kinds of stuff. And I love that this character though, like Lillian said, has only so many like time, only so much time on the page is such an important player. And it really, I think Bertha forces us to ask very big and important questions. And I challenge you the next time you read it to think of her as you're going through the book and see what questions she makes you think about and reflect maybe on the answers that you, that you find. Mm -hmm. And I think very similarly to what Piper said, that's, I think it's incredible. I think it's one of the things we'll probably talk about in why Jane Eyre episode. And I also do want to say thank you to everybody who responded to that. Like that has affected the structure and the conversations that we've had. We sort of alluded and summarized what people's thoughts were versus I know we had originally talked about reading off specific people's responses. We got so many responses Mm -hmm. and I just want you to know, I read all of them. I was diving into that thread this week. Like (laughs) that absolutely affected the way I thought about and discussed this. Mm -hmm. Um, And it just didn't fit in this wildly long episode (laughs) for us to read people's specific thoughts. But if you are interested and you enjoyed listening to this episode, as we mentioned, going and listening to that um, on air as on the Hot and Bothered podcast it's, I can't remember exactly what episode we'll put it in the description, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, that's great. Also going into the Facebook group, there's so much great discussion about all the different aspects of Jane Eyre. That's the Jane Eyre files with a PH, uh, Facebook group. And there's a post that Piper did asking for feedback on Bertha. And there was so many responses on that. And we really, really appreciate you guys taking your time and energy to to give us your thoughts on that. Yes, thank you guys so much. And speaking of Facebook, if you want to share further thoughts with me and Lillian, um, you can reach out to us, DM us on our own uh, show social. You can find us at Airbuds, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube now. Lillian's doing YouTubes. They're awesome. Mm-hmm. Check them out. Uh, Twitter, all that jazz. And then also we'd love to hear from you if you have, I'm sure you have many thoughts about what has all been discussed here because I know Lillian and I can, can sympathize when you're listening to a podcast and you're like, but you're not talking about this. <laughs> um, send us an email. What what did we miss? Uh, you can get us. Yeah. We are airbuds at gmail.com. So we'd love to hear from you. And also speaking of social, sometimes we do polls on that social to get people's specific thoughts on, for example, what we're going to do for a Christmas palate cleanser. So our next episode is a Christmas palate cleanser, which our palate cleansers are when we've had too much about Jane and Bertha. And I expect (laughs) women to be locked in all attics and I need something else. Um, So we put out a poll with four different options for movies that we would potentially watch. And This was the tightest any of our polls have ever been in terms of coming to a conclusion. I was doing the totals right before our recording, and I literally just now was checking to see if we got any additional ones, (laughs) because originally there was a tie between Christmas Carol and Meet Me in St. Louis. Is it supposed to be St. Louis? Is it supposed to be Meet Me in St. Louis? Because I've always heard Meet Me in St. Louis. Oh, Lily, and there's a scene in the movie where they talk all about that. (laughs) So if we watch that one, you'll find out. (laughs) Okay. What a fun surprise. Um, Anyway, so I had to dive even deeper because I used all the comments counted as a vote. Um, all of the actual poll responses on Twitter and Instagram stories counted as a vote. So I went back to make sure I didn't miss any on any channels. And I found the deciding vote was there was a like from someone on a comment (laughs) about one of the, somebody else's preference and they hadn't voted anywhere else. So we are going to watch meet me in St. Louis. Yay. And now you can find out if it's St. Louis or St. Louis. Oh, guys, we're leaving you on a cliffhanger. If you <laughs> loved our thoughts about Bertha and are so excited to find out with me whether it's St. Louis or St. Louis, <laughs> um, we are. Uh, you can give us our your all of your thoughts and feelings publicly with a rating. Please be nice. Mm-hmm. I'm fragile. <laughs> <laughs> And so however many stars you feel we've earned, if I feel, I feel we've earned five, but you have your own opinions 
um, please share that. And it really genuinely helps us find more people and make this podcast that we love for our listeners who we love. Yes, we would love to hear from you guys and to help share the podcast because we need more people to join these discussions because there's somewhere out there a thought that someone has about this that we had that hasn't been shared yet. Everything. So uh, we thank you for joining us on this first uh, character discussion, dissection, analysis. Uh, probably we're going to do this for some of the other major characters in the novel. So stay tuned for that. And thank you for joining us. We look like forward pilot. to see, yes, a whole one about pilot. How much of a good boy is he? All the good boys. <laughs> there <we> go. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Um, so tune in next time. We love you. Happy Jane Eyre reading and watching. Bye. Bye. <laughs>